thank you for the question. I think um, sporadic kind of just refers to the the nature of CTE in general in that it's responsive to local workforce needs. Um, districts are in the position to adjust their programs. Um, in some cases, that may mean a, a complete shift to the offerings that they have, um, adding new programs in areas that may be a priority um, to address local workforce needs. Um, as far as including um, the funding for the CTE programs in the accountability system, that is actually the direction that um, has been, been taken from the administration. As we all know, the accountability system is currently um, undergoing a, a significant reform. Um, there's discussions as to which metrics should be contained in that accountability system, and that's something that the administration is obviously carefully involved with. Um, the LCAP was designed in such a way to encourage districts to address the funding that they've provided to CTE programs, specifically in the areas of school climate and, um, and student accountability. Um, we feel that there's room in that LCAP for districts to address uh, their goals in those areas, um, as well as to report on how they've achieved those goals. Uh, if it's CTE programs, that would be part particularly um, student participation rates, as well as success in completion in the programs. Uh, Ms. Alexander, thank you. And, and I, don't, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record here today, and I, I don't think I'll make this point again, but uh, I, I would just plead with, with you and the Department of Finance, uh, you know, and the, and the administration uh, to to recognize what is happening and what is not happening on the ground. Uh, you know, time is marching quickly. This three-year window of grants will, will uh, you know, we will march through it very quickly. I have seen zero evidence, uh, at least in my district, that uh, school districts are preparing for, uh, uh, you know, a, a 2018 world uh, where LCFF funding will replace grant funding for CTE. Uh, I don't believe that the fact that the grants were fully sought and that you were able to allocate qualifying grants to the full amount that was appropriated, I don't believe that that is an indication that school districts are going to step up and uh, replace that with LCFF funds when this grant program winds down. I think that it speaks to Mr. Wood's point that these institutions are very difficult to rebuild once lost, and this is the money that's being used to keep these programs alive uh, while people throughout the state hope for uh, different policy out of Sacramento. So I, am, I, I wish I could share your optimism about what is happening during this three-year window of grants, but I don't see any evidence that that is true, at least in, in, uh, in and around my district. And that's certainly, uh, you know, a concern that we, we have heard from the field. Um, we would note that in crafting the incentive grant program specifically, we were uh, crafting it in a way to encourage sustainable partnerships being formed, um, specifically the, lo the local match requirement, as well as the requirement to show how the programs uh, would be sus sustained um, three years after the end of the grant cycle. But that is a concern that we've, we've heard and we are... Um, looking into that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question. With regard to the LCAPs, is there any, uh, are the LCAPs required to address CTE in any fashion? The, um, the two, two of the key priority areas um, that the state, uh, we feel that the, the state requires to be met um, and that CTE can, um, can fulfill that requirement are the areas of student achievement and uh, student engagement. Now, um, how districts go about addressing those, those areas and the goals that they set is, again, decided at the local level. Um, but there, there is guidance provided um, through some of the technical assistance um, that county offices provide when they're reviewing the LCAPs, as well as, um, you know, as we're, as we're looking at the accountability system and, and looking at providing more assistance to provide clear direction to the field as they develop their LCAPs. We're certainly um, making sure that they're aware that CTE is an is a area that can meet those requirements. So, with all due respect, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and maybe maybe that's the problem. If if uh, and this is you know a conversation that we're not going to end today, I'm sure. But um, just a comment is if 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 
under the LCFF umbrella, CTE is not required, right, then, then it's not required. Then there's no mandated CTE across the state. And I, I you know, earlier, you know, CTE looks different in different places across the state. And I, I applaud that because that is very true. In, in an agricultural area, it'll look different than it will be in a in rather industrial area. But again, I think it goes back to, uh, you know, as a high school teacher, I think kids need multiple paths to success. Um, and we've gotten away from that about the last 20, 22 years, where basically everyone's going to a four-year school, um, in theory, but not in practice, and we know that in this room for sure. So, you know, again, I, to your point, Mr. Hadley, I think, I think the, the challenge here is how do we uh, maintain CT efforts, CT efforts on the ground when they aren't required? when, you know, everybody's so enamored with this four-year school route, which they should be, and every child should have that option, but they should have an option to find other paths to success, too. So I think we're going to have to have future conversations about that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman O'Donnell, for that. Um, and, and I do want to sort of not to beat a dead horse or anything, but... I, obviously, we appreciate the nine hundred million dollars, and it did, and it has done something, and it has helped some of our, you know, some of our communities. However, I think the point is, and I think what we're all really experiencing, and what we're really hearing from our communities, is that if it's not required, then quite honestly, the money will go somewhere else. So I just, I hope that when you are designing your principles that you take into consideration the 70% of students that will never see the inside of a community college or a four-year university. Those are the kids that I represent. And I hope that you design that when you design your principals. So moving on from there, uh, Charlie Hoffman, Superintendent Bella Vista Elementary School District and Shasta Trinity Regi Regional Occupation Program. Hello, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity that you uh, provided for some practitioners to be here to speak to you and uh, I'm particularly appreciative that some of the points that I had hoped to make to you all today you all made for me in your opening remarks uh, I would say as a representing ROPs uh, thank you for the grants and thank you for that funding I would say without a doubt they have provided a lifeline and they've helped uh they've helped us beef up some existing programs with equipment purchases and such and they've helped uh, some of our school districts start new programs that were good programs linked to local industry and such but i i would clear up any misconception that that they are tantamount to a dedicated stream of funding they're absolutely not uh, in our community in Redding, in Shasta County, uh, we, we, we were an entire two-county ROP. Not a lot of people, not a lot of school districts up there. Uh, and during flexibility, all of the districts except one chose to remain part of the ROP under flexibility. The one district that left the ROP subsumed half the ROP's budget into their general fund and assured the community that they would continue to offer CTE but do it on their own and call it CTE instead of ROP. And here we are five years later, and our ROP offers a NATEF ASE certification in auto shop. Students that complete it, we have about 80 to 90 percent of them in a very high unemployment region, get offered jobs. Uh, there's not a single auto shop in that entire district with the three largest high schools in Shasta County that left and said they would do it on their own. Our ROP offers a two-year firefighting program that provides state fire marshal basic firefighter certification our graduates from our program get hired by CAL FIRE, seasonal firefighters. Uh, there's no firefighting program that provides certification in that district that left the ROP. They do a medical careers orientation. Our ROP does certified nurse assisting. 100% of our certified nurse assistants that pass the state CNA test get recruited for multiple job offers, the shortage of rural health care, right? I go on and on with all of our programs. Cisco, Network Administration, A-plus Computer Repair. They do some neat robotics programs with their grant money in that district that left the ROP. Not a single one of their students in five years has received a Network Administration certification or an A-plus Computer Repair certification 
those students come out and they make a higher hourly rate generally than teachers in their high schools. So the grants have been really nice. Thank you. They're not a dedicated stream of funding. And uh, without the accountability built in for student outcomes, this is where I can speak as a K-8 superintendent who does an LCAP and as an ROP superintendent that provides meaningful student outcomes, uh, an accountability system that was predicated on student outcomes is different than accountability system predicated on a plan that may sit on a shelf or may simply document good work that's already being done in a school district. And uh, absent an accountability system that links directly to student outcomes, in this case, specifically to CTE, uh, what Mr. Weichel said is absolutely coming true in Shasta County, as you have said you've seen in your districts. Uh, easy to support the concept of subsidiarity and the LCFF, but if all local decisions were great local decisions, there would be no dysfunctional schools, school districts, city administrations, right? All local decisions aren't always good decisions. And, and an example of that is in that district where they chose to exercise flexibility to leave the ROP. The parents of the students who are now juniors and seniors, who ideally would be holding administration and school board accountable for not offering the kinds of programs that students in those schools used to have access to, those parents don't even know they don't have access to those programs anymore because their kids were in fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade when that district made the decision to leave the ROP under flexibility. So the state did a really good thing 50 years ago when it created ROPs. Our, our classes are expensive, they're unique, they require a, a unique focus to establish the industry, local employer partnerships, and build those special facilities. Um, seeing that dismantled, dismantled, that system dismantled in a fiscal sense the grants haven't replaced that at all. And when the grants are gone, it will be worse than it is. Thank you. I wanted to welcome Assemblymember Santiago. Uh, Assemblymember Santiago, do you want to do an introduction or do you have any questions? I'm okay with the introductions you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Guy, Principal of Elk Grove High School. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to let me share um, something about our district and my high school. Um, so I've been in education for 30 years, uh, both as um, a teacher, vice principal and principal. And our district is fairly large. It's the fifth largest district um, in California. And, um, and as I say my comments, I'm going to provide you examples of the best work that we've provided um, just to give a, a sense of the commitment that we have our district and both myself to career technical education. Um, I am so fortunate to see every day the direct impact of CTE programs on students and I'd like to share some of those stories. But our district has over 30 career um, themed uh, academies as well as pathways in each of the 15 industry sectors. We have over 140 career technical education courses. And when ROP went away, those ROP type courses remain only at the, um, at the academy level. And so really it's our capstone course um, for our students. Elk Grove High School is an old school. It was built in um, the, where we currently are in, in 1964. And that's important because there's been very little in modernization. So here we have a 50 plus year old site facility with equipment and um, in many cases sometimes teachers who've taught there for a long time, not 50 years, but about 20 plus years. That, that speaks to the professional development that's needed. And um, we're very proud because we saw the need to provide a different uh, avenue for students to be successful. And so right around 2008, we started up two uh, California partnership academies and we um, enhance the career pathways that we already have on our site. So we have um, an automotive technology pathway, business and finance, 
uh, child development, culinary arts, and uh, we've just written a new pathway, an education pathway, because we saw the need to provide teachers and classified personnel um, in the education sector. Our two California partnership academies are the Technology and Digital Arts, and we have a Sustainable Agriculture uh, Green Academy. By the way, these two academies were named by the California Department of Education as exemplary programs. So we're extremely committed to our work. Um, but I want to talk about three students because I think they exemplify, hopefully, the goals that we are, are trying to achieve, and I think that's important. So the first student is, is Godfrey. He came to us as a sophomore, a young African-American uh, student. He failed every course his ninth grade year, failed every course. And um, after three years in the Technology and Digital Arts Academy, he failed only one class. And why is that? And that's because our TDA staff provided the wraparound services needed. It's almost like a small learning community within the school. These students have the same teachers. They're with the same students. They have a dedicated counselor. They have a dedicated administrator. It's a lot of resources. This young man graduated with a high school diploma. He came back. Um, a couple of years to mentor our ninth graders to say, don't follow the same path that I, that I took, but you know what, get a year ahead than I had uh, the chance to, to have. Another student by the name of Evie. Evie is a program completer. Um, she's currently working in the video advertising industry. She was on the leadership team for our academy because every academy has a student-centered leadership team. Um, her group brought in the most um, um, funds, money, uh, to provide to different types of, um, of fundraising or charities, rather. So CTE students are provided uh, work-based learning opportunities, and Evie was able to achieve her dream job, which is in advertising. Andre is another four-year academy completer and he obtained his degree in journalism. And I mention all of these is because it doesn't have to be a path between am I going to college or am I going into a career? Because we approach it as we're gonna to try to keep as many doors of opportunity open for you. Um, so currently he's a journalist and he's working to um, increase AIDS awareness um, in Africa as well as some other Asian countries. Um, our academy uses contests. They use public service announcements as a springboard to uh, create a relevant type of curriculum. And so um, our students uh, a few years ago um, won an award for a PSA around texting and driving. Um, over 10,000 uh, viewers on Channel 10's website saw that. Uh, we've also created PSAs around teen suicide and uh, teen mental health issues. So our students are working in very relevant in topics that are important to them, and it's going to prepare them later on in life. Um, this next week, our students are going to IDEO. I don't know if you've heard of this design company. They're very innovative. They're the ones that created the, the design of the Apple Mouse. They also designed the um, lavatory occupied sign on airplanes, <laughs> and uh, as well as you know having a, a toothpaste stand up. And our students are thrilled to be able to go to IDEO to collaborate on a project with IDEO employees. Um, and th all of these type of experiences would not be possible without the dedicated funding just for CTE. As a high school principal, you probably know there are many distractions, many competitions, and multiple interests. We all know that student learning is at the heart of what we do and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but without dedicated CTE funds, um, I, I, I don't know how we would move forward in being able to, to not just sustain what we already have, but, but grow the CTE programs. My site is 50 years old, and as a bridge right now, our district is already looking at what, what type of work can we, can we accomplish in the next couple of years. And I have to say, with my staff, we're taking a look at those quality indicators. We're doing a needs assessment, and just initially, I'm looking at what is absolutely needed that I don't even have the funds to be in, begin to uh, modernize the equipment, 
the facilities, provide the materials and resources. The other piece that's critical is the professional development. We have an aging baby boomer, boomer set of teachers, and we have new teachers that are coming in. They have to be trained in order, in order to have the CTE <clears throat> credential, so that's vitally important. Um, but um, I'll stop here. I won't continue, but I want to thank you for the opportunity to allow me a few minutes to share um, some, some great stories about my school. Thank you. And I do have a question for either one of you. Um, without the ongoing funding, what, what do you really see as the future of your programs without the dedicated funding? We'll continue to offer services to just the districts that choose to opt in and continue to be part of the ROP on their own. They give us their general fund money now in order for us to operate. Uh, there will never be enough money in the CTE grade level augmentation in the LCFF to equal what had been ROP funding. Uh, frankly, those districts chose to opt in and continue to support CTE because it's a it's a strong community value in Shasta County, rural county. We have a very low A to G completion rate, and, and kids want to stay there. Families want kids to stay there. It's a, it's a CTE community. Uh, but those districts, those superintendents and principals are expecting that CTE outcomes will be built into whatever accountability system eventually gets put into place. If they didn't have that anticipation, I think they might have opted out despite the community really valuing the programs the way the, the one district did opt out. So I would say um, the field trips, the, uh, the reaching out to business and industry leaders would not happen. Uh, the field trips to both businesses as well as colleges would not happen. Um, back when um, our budgets were severely reduced about five years ago, um, we ba barely held on to our courses. Um, and our teachers who, who tend to be CTE teachers or our newer teachers, they receive pink slips. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as you have a teacher who has a CTE credential and they're pink slipped and, and they leave, so, so does the course. Um, so the funds have to be dedicated. Hold me accountable as a principal. Tell me the quality indicators that I have to reach. Uh, we're used to providing data. Let me tell you the number of students who are completers. Let me tell you the number of students who've met A through G compliance. You know, the academy students right now outperform non-academy students, as you may know, right, in attendance, grade point average, meeting A through G, on and on and on and on. So this program works. This idea works. And so I just hope that we're allowed to continue that. Uh, thank you very much. I kind of, kind of got a long-winded question because I've dealt with this issue over the years, and I've always kind of really struggled between um, dedicated revenue streams, which we knew as categoricals, and, and um, what we now know as local controlled funding formula, and, and quite frankly, the consortium money, right? Because in L.A., as we all know, the consortium had its challenges, and, and it's still kind of kind of challenged, but most of the conversations are about money and and the voting, the voting um, organism that they have there and, and how that'll continue to move over the next couple of years. Look, when I sat on the community college board, we had the same challenges, um, and a lot of them were the same, the pathways. And when we mean comprehensive pathways, we talked everything about contextualized coursework, uh, the certification programs, um, all the equipment, the, uh, um, the equipment, and, and, and actually the curriculum matching industry standards, right, because that was really the, the biggest challenge we faced when I first got on the community college board is we had all these great programs, but they, none of them matched industry standards. And, and so it didn't matter who we, who we, um, who we graduated, right? And, and it didn't matter that the local school was doing um, CTE and the community college was doing CTE because there's no forced conversation between the two. And when there was, it was always a fight about money because that's really what it was, right? So it was about money before it was curriculum, before it was anything else or programming. And, and, I, and, and you know, to take care of the local issues, we had to do bond measures because the state's not going to kick in any money and we were left at the table over and over and over waiting for state dollars. It's just not going to happen. Um, and I wonder if, if, if you had a, a magic wand and took a look at a comprehensive approach really to handle um, career technical training, you know, what would be those, all those tools if there was that magic wand, right? Would it be bond dollars? Would it be this? And help me because, because I, I always kind of, kind of struggle with the fact that if you don't have a quote-unquote categorical and it is not tied to all the things that we talked about, 
industry standards, pathways, contextualized coursework, uh, job ready programs, then you're really not gonna get the result that you're hoping for. Um, and it won't happen in the, in the area that some of us represent in Southern California because the local school district is, is gonna be looking at about 100 to $200 million in debt over the next several years. And when the consortium money runs out, all these programs will, will evaporate. Um, so I wonder if, the, if, if, if anybody could help us with, with that sort of long-winded question. Well, I, again, my K-8, my elementary district superintendent role, I was glad to see many of the categoricals go away. But I don't know that categorical, we need to paint it with a broad brush as categoricals are bad micromanagement. Sometimes micromanagement is needed because all local decisions aren't always good. You can Im impact those local decisions through the accountability measures. Um, the problem with grants and bonds is they're one-time money and you never spend your Christmas gift cards the same way you spend your paycheck. And districts are grant money and bond money is not the same as an ongoing ADA generated by student attendance stream of funding. Yeah. So you would lean towards categorical? Absolutely. So. With conditions as sim very similar to what has been attached to the CTE incentive grants. Those, that m money had to go to s districts that offered high quality CTE programs, not the old standalone exploratory <laughs> one and done shopping mall approach to voc ed that many of us experienced when we were in school but programs that were sequences of courses that lead to industry certifications that uh, the course themselves is an a to g course despite the fact that it's uh, a career ed course uh, articulated or dual enrollment college credits most of our courses are like that so if they're high quality courses rather than the traditional school operated voc ed that we many of us experienced then i don't see that a categorical that would support that would be a bad thing. What would be those elements when I talked about a comprehensive approach inside of those categoricals, top three, top five things that you would actually point at um, that you would receive this money if you did this? Again, I think they're in the CT incentive grant. Industry certifications is huge because that's your employability ticket. Sequences of courses rather than standalone courses. What would be your so, third? so it's the items that are already part of the incentive grant program. We would just extend it. I mean, the th the hope would be that that would be extended, yeah. and um, and the pathway is tremendously important in that process. So maybe I can help with that a little bit. I I think if I were looking at a way to fund uh, career technical education in the future, uh, I don't think I'd necessarily pay districts to offer CTE. But I think I'd uh, pay districts who offer CTE and uh, have strong outcomes with CTE. So I think you could look at several things. I think one is in a district, uh, we have districts around the state that have 30, 40, 50 percent of their students enrolled in career technical education. And I know of a couple of districts in this state that have none. They don't even offer CTE on those campuses. And so, you know, I would pay districts. Uh, based on the number of participants they have in career technical education. And then, and I think that incentivizes districts that want to offer those programs. And then in, as Charlie knows, and I think anybody in career technical education knows that the right way to do it is offer a sequence of courses so they're sequential, non-duplicative sequence of courses. So we have students that are, we refer to as concentrators. Those are students that have been in a program over a year long and are really focusing in on that occupational area. So if you're going to encourage districts to sequence their courses rather than offer a bunch of singleton individual courses, you know, a course in welding, then one in health, and you want to encourage them to sequence their courses, pay districts for the number of concentrators they have in a, in a program, CTE program. And then if you truly want outcomes, you pay districts on the number of students who successfully complete a program by passing industry certification or a third party assessment. If you do that, you're paying the districts that are doing it right. You're not just paying districts for doing it. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, if I can just make one comment on this discussion, I would like to change the vocabulary a little bit. I, I don't believe this is a, a 
decision between local control and um, and micromanagement. Uh, I I just think the simple reality of of the culture and the view of education in our society and how our school boards get elected and the culture within so much of our educational world is such that the the parents and the elected school board trustees do not think it is their job to prioritize CTE with funds that are that are being allocated generally for education. I just don't we can we can hope that they think that's their job. We can wish that we think that's their job, but I have seen very little evidence that they think that's their job. And uh, so I don't think we're micromanaging to support CTE. We are helping the students of the state. We are helping the employers of the state. We are giving pathways to students, to young people who are not going to get these pathways unless we support these programs. And so I, if we if we frame this in local control versus micromanagement, I don't think we're making progress. We just need to deal with the realities of, of our elected school boards around, around the state and work with them to, to serve our students. Thank you. And I also want to thank you. I do think that having the, the, having the accountability and creating some sort of accountability system for an ongoing process is, is tremendously important. Um, and I understand what you're saying. I just, I do think we, we do need accountability because that's how we lose funding is when we don't see results. So, uh, Jeremy Smith, Deputy Legislative Director, State Building and Construction Trade Council of California. Thank you for coming today.